And we're back in the Ten Commandments. We're on commandment number seven today. And before we get into the Ten Commandments and the Seventh Commandment today, uh, you know what I like to do with uh, the beginning of each one of these commandments is I want us to get these commandments etched in our hearts. I want God's finger to etch them in the tablets of our hearts. So let's stand. Let's all stand. Let's do our responsive reading, and let's read all Ten Commandments. I'm hoping you're close to having these memorized by now. Uh, so let, let's read them together responsively. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make idols. Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Number five, honor your father and your mother. Number six, you shall not murder. This week's number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number 10, you shall not covet. Well done, church. You're getting those down. That's great. And so today, we're looking at the seventh commandment. You may be seated. And the seventh commandment, very simply put, is you shall not commit adultery. Adultery, what is that? It's going outside of God's boundaries. It's going outside his boundaries of sexual immorality, outside the boundaries of a husband-wife relationship. And it's wrong. I don't care what our culture says. I don't care what famous celebrities say about how monogamous uh, relationships aren't even possible. That's, that's a bunch of, I, you, say that, you can say that in the Greek, that's a bunch of baloney. That, it's translated in the Greek, baloney. No, it's not. It's just baloney. Baloney. It's not, it's, it is so wrong. We're living in an age where good is being called, is being called evil, evil is being called, being called good. And we need to be countercultural. If you want to be rebellious, let's be rebellious against the devil and the standards that he has in this culture. Amen? Let's be different. The Bible says that we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. We're supposed to be declaring to this world the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And the darkness of immorality is all around us. So let's shine and let's be different. Let's be holy in the midst of that. And so here's how I like to picture marriage. It's a good picture. Marriage is like you're at, this, you're at this mountaintop and you begin at the top of the mountain with your spouse and you do. Weddings are awesome. Don't you love weddings? It's a mountaintop experience, your wedding. I mean, I love just being up there when I'm officiating weddings and I see the look on the groom when the bride comes in with the white dress and she's the most beautiful person in the world to that groom and it's, it's, it's a mountaintop. But here's the deal. The mountaintop begins, but then you're going down this steep road that has all these bends in marriage. It's the road of marriage. And not only is there all these different bends in the road to marriage, but there's precipices and there's cliffs. And not only that, as you go down this steep road, here's the, here's the end of the road. As you make it down that end of the road, it's a beautiful valley. It's a valley of remembrances of great times. It's a valley of a crop, and fertile crop of just blessing. It's a valley of just God's goodness in that marriage. And that's basically what God wants you to be blessed. His commandments are not to reign in your parade. His, his commandments are to bless you. And here's the deal. As you go down this road of marriage to this blessing and this fertile, beautiful blessing that represents a fertile, beautiful marriage, there's cliffs, there's precipices, and what do you need to be safe with that road and those cliffs and precipices? Can you say guard, guardrails? And one of the best, strongest, most important guardrail is the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. Guard your marriage, your home, your passengers. Your passengers, guess who the passengers that get on this marriage road with you are? Your kids. And, and if, if you're not careful and don't have this guardrail up, you could kill your marriage. You could, or you can maim your marriage, and you could also hurt your passengers, your kids. So again, the reasons why we have those thou shall nots that we're looking at in the Ten Commandments aren't to rain in your parade. They aren't to take fun out of life. They're to bless your life. First John tells us the commandments of God are not burdensome. They're for your blessing. So we're going to look at this commandment. It's a strong one. It's an important one. And it's a guardrail on the road to a fertile, beautiful marriage that will keep your marriage safe. 
You ready to look at a church? Let's, before we do, let's pray again. Father, we just thank you again, Father, for an opportunity to look at a very important commandment that's going to be a safeguard to marriages in this room, God. And Father, I pray that you just give us ears to hear what your Spirit's going to say to each one of us. Give us just a, a, a soft heart to whatever changes, whatever applications, whatever truths you want us to grab onto, God. Help us to be listening to your Spirit, God, today. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said. Okay. What, right? Why and how. That's, our, that's what we're looking at, each, each commandment. What? What is the seventh commandment? Thou shalt not commit adultery. We've already said it. It's going outside of God-ordained boundaries uh, and with, with, with your sexuality, and it's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. I don't care what the rest of the culture says. It's wrong. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Let me give, give you some statistics on this. Um, bottom line, we're living in an adulterous generation. Bottom line. I was reading this week, 31% of Americans even either, uh, that are married have, have either had an affair or are having an affair, and that's just the ones that are telling the truth. 31%. 62% of Americans are, are, uh, that are in the midst of an affair, if, you, if they're part of that, that 31%, 62% of them say, what I'm doing with this affair, there's nothing wrong with it. And their rationale is, everybody else in the culture is doing it. I'm fine doing it too. 62% of people having affairs say, it's, it's no problem. It's no big deal. 58% of divorces today say one of their main contributions, leading causes of their divorce was an adulterous affair. It's killed. 62% of divorces uh, say that it was a leading cause to their divorce. Interesting. Um, 67% of married couples uh, say they're tempted uh, to have an affair. 62%. One third of all married men in the United States of America have an affair during their married life. One quarter of all married women in the United States have an affair within their married life. And that's a scary place to be as a culture. You know why? Because it can lead to God's judgment. The Bible says that fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And I tell you what, if you look at the Roman Empire, I love history. And when I studied the Roman Empire a little bit, especially in college in my history classes, you know the Roman Empire was never conquered by another nation. You know what happened to the Roman Empire? Most, one of the most powerful empires in world history. It imploded from within. And one of the main reasons why it imploded was because of the immorality. And one of the main things that were going on in the Roman Empire was the immorality we're talking about, adultery and fornication, because orgies and all kinds of wild stuff like that was going on all over the Roman Empire, including temple prostitutes and as, even as a form of worship. It was craziness. And that craziness led to, led to a world power being diminished and destroyed. You need to pray for our country. We need to pray that we get away from the craziness of the immorality that's all around us because otherwise it's going to bring God's judgment. Now, before we get rolling on this, let me tell you something. God is not against sex. God is pro-sex. Did you know that? Who created sex? God did. He's pro-sex. And you know what? He even said to the first human beings, be fruitful and multiply. I'm telling that to my kids right now that are married. Come on, let's get on with this thing. <laughs> Want some grandkids? Be fruitful, multiply, let's go. God is pro sexuality. And it's not just for procreation. God is pro sexuality because He created sex to be something that will bring you together with your spouse and cause an intimacy and a oneness emotionally, physically, and spiritually. It's something that actually binds you together with your spouse in a good way. How do I know God's pro sex? He even said through the Apostle Paul, listen to Paul in this, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 3 to 5. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body. A husband does. Likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body. The wife does. Look at the verse 5. Stop depriving one another. Of what? Of sex. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You know what those verses are saying? We're not supposed to deprive our spouses of this very important thing called sex. It's supposed to be something you're supposed to be giving as a gift to your spouse. And husbands, do you want that cross-reference again? <laughs> 1 Corinthians 7, 
verses 3 to 5. That could be part of your arsenal. Paul said this. Right? It's, it's a beautiful thing. God's created it. It's something we're supposed to enjoy. It's something supposed to be with it, but it's supposed to be within the boundaries of a healthy marriage and not go outside the guardrail of thou shalt not commit adultery. Why? So we can be blessed. So we can have great marriages. Interesting. There's a whole book about this written in the Bible. It's called the Song of Solomon. And it's all about healthy, healthy romance and sexuality. And it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. So let me give you three reasons. Three reasons why. Why is this an important commandment? Why should we not go outside the boundaries of, of, of sex within marriage between a husband and wife? Number one reason is because it separates this oneness that God has ordained with marriage. You see, God ordained marriage to be something beautiful. God ordained sex to be something sacred and holy. He even said in Genesis chapter 2, the beginning of marriage, he said, so the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place, and the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from man and brought her to the man, and the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They were not ashamed. They were one. And it was a beautiful thing. Now, we saw last week, when God created the, all creation, after each day, he said, it is good. It is good. It is good. And then what did he do on the sixth day? Who did he create? Human beings. And then he said, it is very good, if I do say so myself. That is very good. Because human beings were the, the finale. They were the crown of God's creation. They were created in God's image. But then after that, shortly after that, he said, it's not good. Do you remember when he said it's not good? When he looked down on man and he was alone. He said, I'm going to create woman. And man and woman are to be together. And they're not going to be lonely anymore because they got each other. And then they're going to be one flesh. And that's a beautiful thing. A beautiful, strong, healthy marriage takes away the loneliness of being going through life without a companion. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. But when adultery gets involved, it tears that oneness. What happens is there's a tearing that goes on that could devastate and even kill the marriage. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes, even after adultery, God's grace could come in and forgiveness and mercy could be there. I've seen it dozens of times the last 30 years of ministry where someone forgives, lets go of it, and they actually reconcile after even an adulterous affair, but it's hard. It's very hard. When adultery gets involved, the trust goes away, the respect goes away, and it's devastating. It tears on that one flesh relationship, and we need to guard our marriages from that and a fair proof of our marriages from that because it's devastating oftentimes right? And like I said, in the last 30 years, I've seen it, seen the devastation of affairs. And Hebrews 13, 4 addresses this very thing. It says, marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge. Proverbs 6, 32 says, the one who commits adultery with a woman is lack in sense, and he who would destroy himself does it. Let me translate it this way. Having an affair, according to Proverbs right there, you're being foolish. Put it another way. You're being stupid. Stupid. Because ultimately, you're even harming yourself. You're harming your home. You're doing all this damage that sometimes could even be pushing on, on irreparable. Now, I believe by God's grace it can be. Forgiveness and mercy can help us repair it, but it hurts and it tears on a marriage. Number two reason why. Number one reason it tears that one flesh relationship with God ordained for marriage. Number two reason. It breaks your covenant that you made with your spouse. I love weddings. It's one of the fun things you do as a preacher is do weddings. I love doing weddings. But I love doing vows too. When, when people commit to one another, what do they say in their vows? For better or for worse? For richer or for poor? In sickness and in health? Until what? Until death. You know, we're going to be faithful to each other as long as we both shall live is what the vows say. And when we break that, instead of being a covenant keeper, we're being a covenant breaker. You know, I love Promise Keepers when it was in its 
peak and heyday. I don't know if you guys remember Promise Keepers or not, but I remember going to Promise Keepers events where there's tens of thousands of guys in a stadium. And one of the things that Promise Keepers did very, very well to challenge men to get back to being a promise keeper, a covenant keeper, uh, to not only to God, but to our families. And we need to get back to that. Husbands, we need to get back to staying true to our word. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Husbands, we need to get back to saying, I am committed to one person, and that's my, my spouse, period. Wives, you need that too, because I'm seeing craziness in our culture. It's not just men having affairs right now. I'm seeing women doing it too. Get back to your vows, your commitment that you're going to be faithful to the other person as long as you both shall live. You know what? Here's another thing with that too. Don't ever flirt with anybody, anybody but your spouse. That's just foolishness too. Don't ever, and here, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit farther. Your best friend should be Jesus. Your second best friend should be your spouse. And then don't have best friends that are the opposite sex if you're married. It's not smart. It is not smart. Guard that. Be careful with that. Be a covenant keeper instead of a covenant breaker. Amen? Here's another, the third reason why we've got to be careful in this area. Third reason why this commandment is so important. Because of the pain it inflicts when you get outside that guardrail. Not only the pain to you, but the pain to your spouse and kids. And some of you, I could see it in your eyes right now, you know what I'm talking about. Because you grew up in a home where you had a parent that didn't stay with these guardrails. According to the statistics, probably one out of every three of you grew up in a home that had adultery racking that home and hurting that home. And you know what? I'm right there in the camp. I grew up in a home like that. And it's devastating. And it hurts, doesn't it? It really hurts. And one of the main things that God had to heal me from after I came to Christ, and to be honest with you, he's still in the process of healing. There's still scars in here because those guardrails were, were neglected or disregarded in my family. Jesus says, I've come to bind up the brokenhearted to set free those that are captives, to heal that which is bruised. But one of the main bruises I see in our culture today is homes that are dysfunctional and going outside these boundaries, and it hurts. It hurts. Now let me tell you some other reasons why we've got to be careful in this area of protecting and affair-proofing our marriages because the main person, one of the main persons, you don't understand this, but one of the main persons you're going to hurt if you go outside these boundaries is yourself. Listen to 1 Corinthians, what it says about this. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 to 18. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. That's translated in the Greek. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Who are you hurting when you get outside these guardrails? First of all, you're hurting yourself. You're hurting yourself. Second thing you're hurting when you get outside these guardrails, I'll be honest with you of this, your church. Your church. If you say you go to Calvary Chapel and you're a Christian and then you're out there being immoral, what's the reputation of the church? I mean, and you, some of you say, well, my, my personal life is none of your business, Pastor John. I disagree. It is my business. Because as iron sharpens iron, we're supposed to hold each other accountable. We're supposed to be brothers and sisters of Christ. And family members deal with this kind of stuff and don't let it go and sweep it under the carpet, right? And let me tell you something else. It's, it's my sexual life is your business too. I need to be held accountable in this area. I need to be someone who's willing to, to say, hey, hold me accountable. It's very important that we have accountability in this area and realize that you're hurting the reputation of Christ if you go outside these boundaries. And let, let me tell you something else also. You know, else you're, you know how else you're hurting? You're hurting your God. Because the main person you're sinning against when you go outside these boundaries is God. It's God. One time David, man after God's own heart, a man that loved God, supremely. He got outside the boundaries. You remember the story, right? He's walking on his rooftop at a season when King should be at war. He stayed back. And as he was walking on his rooftop, he saw this beautiful lady named Bathsheba. Problem was, she was married to one of his mighty men that were out there at the war fighting. And then he committed full-on adultery with her. 
And then after she found out she was pregnant, he murdered her husband to cover the whole thing up. And then he acted like he was this great guy marrying her to take care of her because she was pregnant. But then a year after doing business as usual, <laughs> a prophet named Nathan came up to David, told him a little story. He said a story about this man that was poor that had one thing that really meant something to him. It was a little sheep. But this rich guy took the sheep and stole it from him, took away the one thing that really mattered to him. And then David got so upset, he said, well, bring the man here. David was going to kill the guy. And then remember what Nathan said? You the man. He didn't say it like that. He said, you're the man. And David said, you're right. And look at what David wrote in Psalm 51. Beautiful psalm on this. He said this. Be gracious. This is after repenting from this adultery. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Look at what he says in verse 4 now. Against what? Talking to God. Against you, God. You only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you're justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. And then he said in Psalm 51, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. I love this. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Do you see that? Ultimately, your adultery will affect your home. It will affect your church. It will affect your, you know, all these other things. It will affect yourself. But ultimately, you're hurting God by going outside these boundaries because God's created you to be, have a one flesh, one person relationship where you're committed to that person, you stay committed, and you keep that covenant. Amen? Amen. 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 And amen, I'll say. You know what amen means, by the way? So be it. And so be it. All right, so we looked at the what. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Looked at the why. Why it's important. Let's look at the how. And here's where the rubber meets the road, guys. Here's where the rubber meets the road, ladies. Number one, first thing, if you're going to fulfill this commandment of thou shalt not commit adultery, very important, you need to guard your what? Your heart. Out, guard your heart, the Bible says. Be diligent to do that because out of your heart flow all the issues of life. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so he is. So I say guard your heart and guard your mind. So be very careful with that. Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 5. He said, verse 27, You've heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust uh, for her has already committed adultery with, with her in his what? There it is, in his heart. And if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out, throw it from you, it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you, for it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. You see what that's saying? It's not saying maim yourself if you're struggling in this area. Don't come here next week with the hands cut off and eyes gouged out, okay? It's not saying that. It's teaching through hyperbole. It's exaggeration. And the, here's what he's teaching. He's teaching a point, and he's saying take drastic measures and your personal lives, if, if necessary, if you're struggling in this area. And we're living in a sex-crazed culture where the devil has more tools than ever to get us to have hearts that are dirty. And it starts with what we're putting in our eyes. You know what? We don't put garbage in our mouths, do we? We shouldn't put garbage in our eyes either. These are windows. And as we expose our eyes to things we shouldn't be seeing, what happens is it brings dirt into our hearts. Remember when we first moved to the house we're in right now, I'm a Dutch guy, I like deals. I always like deals. And I remember the cable or whatever it was that we had, they gave us a deal. They said, okay, first three months, you get everything. And I said, I just want the cheapest possible things just so I can watch TV. But it was the first three months, we give you everything. It's basic cable, but you get everything. And so I said, well, what's everything? Golf Channel, uh, ESPN, one, two, whatever it is. Uh, even the football stuff was on it. I'm going, this is cool. Let's do it. 
And then they started pumping that stuff in my house, and I remember channel surfing, and I'm going, whoa, what was that? And it was HBO. Uh, Adrian Rogers, one of my favorite pastors, calls HBO Hell's Box Office. I'm going, whoa, what was that on my TV? And I switched the channel, but I, and then it switched to Cinemax or something. Whoa, what was that? I'm going, wow, what is on my TV? And at the time, we had all of our kids were pretty much homeless still at the time. I'm going, within three days, I called the cable company. I said, turn that garbage off my TV. I don't want that in my home. I don't need that temptation myself, and I don't need my kids watching that either. Guard, 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 please. Let me say that again. Guard, guard your lives from this kind of stuff. The Bible says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so we need to be careful in this area. And the first thing is we need to guard our hearts. And you know, husbands, some of you, you might be looking at stuff you shouldn't be looking at on the internet. You might need to get what's called covenant eyes. And let your wife be your accountability partner. And if you're watching things you shouldn't watch, she's going to get an email and she'll be on you like a crazy. And that's good. You know, my wife, Heidi, is my greatest accountability partner. She's great at it. She's very good at holding me accountable. I think she actually enjoys it sometimes, too. She's very good at it, and I love her for that, because I need accountability. As iron sharpens iron, so one, one person sharpens another person, and don't be afraid, guys, to ask your wife to do that. That's, that's what we're, we're supposed to be there for each other. And let me tell you something else, too. Don't ever, ever guard yourself. Don't ever, ever flirt with someone besides your spouse. Don't do that. Again, that's stupid. That's foolishness. And you know what? Pastor John gives you full permission to flirt with your spouse as much as you can. Do that. You know, I've got three kids now that are married, and uh, uh, they, they were, all three kids that are married were home this weekend for my birthday weekend, right? And they were flirting with each other all weekend. I'm going, John, they're married. It's fine. I'm going, yeah, but that's kind of, they're flirting all the time. I'm going, that's really cool. That's the way marriage should be. Amen. So do, if you're going to flirt, don't ever flirt with somebody besides your spouse, but flirt as much as you can with your spouse. And that'll help guard your marriage too. Hey, uh, second, second thing we need to be doing. First, guard your hearts. Be careful with that. Uh, again, Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinketh, so he is. Second thing, develop some trusting, accountable relationships with other people you could share your struggles with and have them pray for you. James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be what? Healed. Healed. When I was uh, 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 in seminary, I went to Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. I was from Chicago, but I'd never been to a place like L.A. before. L.A. was supercharged in this area of what I'm talking about this, this morning. It's just a crazy place. It is definitely a land that's different than, you know, they used to say, go west, young man. Not a good idea for a young man to go west. And I remember being out there, and I was in my early 20s, pre-Heidi. Didn't even have a serious girlfriend at the time. And I remember going out there, and one of the things I love is beaches. I love going to beaches. I love the ocean. I'm going to the beach with Heidi this afternoon just for a couple of days to get, to get away for the birthday. But I love beaches. But the beaches out there, they're crazy. And they dress crazy out there, too. And I remember going, man, I need, some, I need some accountability in this area as a single young man with just hormones raging in my early 20s. I need some help with this. And so I remember I got an accountability group. I found two guys, Dave Orlowski and Ron Stubbs. Now, part of my motivation, too, was they were in my Greek class, and I was taking Greek, and there's a reason why it says this is all Greek to me. It's a very difficult language. I was flunking my beginning of seminary in Greek class, and these two guys were the two smartest guys in the class. They were getting A's. I go, I'm going to get in your study group. And I did. But as, as we got to know each other, we started holding each other accountable. Every Thursday night, we'd get together. We'd share our struggles. We'd share whatever, it, guys in their early 20s, in Southern California, we shared our struggles, and we were honest. We shared our sins, too. And then we prayed for each other, read Scripture together, prayed for each other every week. And then at the beginning of the next week, we'd say, how are we doing? And we were honest. We called it the core group. You know what we found out? That didn't hurt our friendship. It helped it. Those two guys went on to become my two best. I didn't have a best man at my wedding. I had best men. And they were the best men at my wedding. And that, you know what else we found out? As we got those things out and we received prayer, we were honest about those things that held each other accountable, we got victory too. The Bible says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory 
in our Lord Jesus Christ. And you get stuff like this out in the open, and you get people praying for you, and you have friends, trusted friends that are helping you with this, you get some strength from that. And the devil gets defeated. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. So let's kick him out and get him fleeing, amen? Let's be honest. Let's get some accountability. Let's get some prayer in this area. Let's get some help. It'll make a difference. Okay, here's another thing, third thing. Continue to court and date your spouse. You know, I think especially guys, after you get married, it's like, well, got that done, what's next? Get her done, we're married. Don't have to worry about this dating stuff anymore. I was tired of buying flowers anyways. No, don't do that. Dating's just beginning when you get married. It's just getting started, just getting rolling. We should, we should be dating all the way until death. You know why? You know, this is important. You know why? Because there's competition out there. And here's what happens. I've seen affairs. Affairs get started sometimes because the spouse starts feeling neglected at home, just disregarded at home, and the, the wife starts thinking, well, the, the only thing I do is dishes around here. The only thing I do is cook for this guy. He, he doesn't pay any attention to me. And then that spouse goes out, or it's the man that's saying, all I do, do is pay bills around here and work, and, and she doesn't even care about me. And then they go out in the real world, and they go out to job or gym or whatever else, and there's somebody that is listening to them, somebody that is laughing at their jokes, somebody that is paying them special attention, and there's Danger, 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 danger. So what's the best way we could solve that problem? By paying attention to your spouse, courting your spouse, loving your spouse, making that spouse the most important person in your world. And so, you know, we got some sod in my backyard right now. And traditionally, Hoppy's, uh, Heidi and I both are very good at killing things in our backyard. And I'm determined this time not to kill this sod. I want some grass in my backyard, right? And so you know what I'm doing? Every night, is, is, if it doesn't rain, every night I'm watering that stuff. And, I'm, and it's cool because you know how you pull up on the sod and it comes up? I'm pulling up on it now. It's not coming up anymore. And it's actually starting to grow and stuff. And I, I've, I've, I've learned something. You know what? The grass is not greener on the other side of the fence. The grass is greener where? Where you water it. You know, the devil wants to tell you, hey, it'll be better with somebody else. Lie, lie from the pit of hell. It ain't going to be better with somebody else. It's going to be better where you water it, where you cultivate it, where you make it better. One of the ways you make it better is by loving and romancing that spouse, making sure that they don't want to go anywhere else because they're taken well care of at home. Amen? Husbands, buy some flowers again, please. Husbands, date your wives again. Wives, romance your husband a little bit more. Pay him some more attention. It'll affair proof your marriage. It'll make it good. Hmm. All right, so let me give you some peace. Go back to Genesis 2, 24 and 25. Let's look at that one more time. 24 and 25. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. I'll give you three Ps that will protect your marriage. Three Ps that will protect your marriage. Number one, part. You want to have a better marriage? Make sure you've left. Make sure your primary human relationship isn't your parents anymore, it's your spouse. The most important human relationship you have is, is your spouse. And sometimes I see marriages are messed up because the parents haven't been left yet. Now, is it wrong to have a close relationship with your parents? No way. Keep a close relationship with your parents, but make sure you've left them and your primary importance is your spouse and not your parents anymore. That's, that's healthy. That's good. Leave. The Bible says leave your father and mother. And then it says cleave. Number two, permanence. Cleave is glued together. It literally means that when, you're, when you get married, you're supposed to have this permanent relationship that's glued together, cemented together. Realize there's a permanence in this thing that you're, that you're, you're, you're till death do you part. What God has joined together, no person's going to separate us. What's that saying to me is this permanence says that you're not, a, not even ever going to consider divorce. Ever. Ever. Because what God has joined together, let no person ever separate. Ruth Graham, wife of Billy Graham, shared this before, but I'll share it again. Back in his heyday, when he was at the pinnacle of doing evangelism around the world, he'd be gone for sometimes six months at a time. I think they either had four or five kids. And 
Ruth Graham would be left alone with these four or five kids for six months at a time sometimes. One time a reporter asked her and said, with all of Billy Graham leaving with these kids all the time, have you ever considered divorce? She goes, I've never considered divorce, ever. Murder, maybe. <laughs> never divorce. Because there's a permanence in that relationship, right? You're glued together. Adrian Rogers, one of my favorite preachers right now, he said, he said you know, people have asked me, what would you do if, if your wife left you? And he said, well, I'd do one thing. I'd ask her, where do you want to go? He says, you leave me. I'm going wherever you're going. Because we're permanently glued together. We're cemented together. This ain't going to end. We're committed to each other. And that's, a, that's the benefit that we have as Christians. The benefit we have is this. Is we don't got any other, other, other options. We've got to work our marriages out. Because we're glued together. We are going to make this permanent. And if it's hard and there's valleys and there's struggles going on, then we're going to get some help. We'll get some counseling. We'll, do what, we'll be in church more, hearing God's word more. We'll be in prayer together more. But we'll do whatever it takes to get help. Because till death do us part, we're committed to one another. Committed to one another. Amen? I have very little tolerance for husbands that come to me and say, well, I just, I've fallen out of love. I'm, I'm not in love anymore. And you know what I'll say to them? It's not a suggestion. It's a command to love your wife. The Bible says, love your wife, period. It's not suggesting that. It's not, it's, and uh, by the way, it's not a, an emotion either. It's a commitment. So I'll give you three Ds. I gave you three Ps, right? The three Ps were, uh, again, go back to them, is part, permanent. Oh, third P, I didn't give it to you. Purpose. Have a purpose in your heart, in your marriage. The purpose is this. The purpose of your marriage is to be one. To be one, again, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Make that your purpose. You're not going to just struggle through your marriage. You're going to be one with that person. You're going to be a soul companion to that person. You're going to be committed to intimacy and growing together and becoming one together. That's your purpose. I'll give you three Ds now, too. Decision, develop, and discipline. Again, I've already said it. It's a decision. It's a decision, decision to love your spouse. You've got to make that decision. And say, so, no matter what, whether they f love me or not, I'm going to love them. You know, the Bible says we're supposed to love our wife's men with an agape love. The word agape means unconditional. It's not based on their performance. It's not based on whether they respect you and love you. You're going to love them anyways. And that's God's love. Isn't that the way God loves us? I mean, if he loved us based on our performance, we'd be in big trouble. He loves us based on grace, on his unconditional agape love. And we're to make a decision. We're going to love our spouses in that way with an unconditional love. Whether they're doing their part or not, we are going to love them. And we're going to respect them. We're going to honor them. Make that decision. Second thing we talked about already, too, is develop. What does that mean? It means work at it, man. Work at it. One of my best friends when, when I was in seminary, Ron Stubbs, I already talked about him. I got together with uh, him for lunch a few years ago. We hadn't seen each other in years. And he's a marriage and family counselor in Des Moines, Iowa. And I had lunch with him and said, well, how's it going, man? We talked about our marriages, our kids, everything else. And, we were, and one of the things he said to me, I'm a marriage and family counselor, but one of the hardest things I've ever had to work on in my whole life was my marriage. It ain't easy. And he was honest with me about that. It takes, takes some development. It takes some work, doesn't it? It takes some prioritizing. It takes some saying, I'm going to work at this thing to make it better, and we're going to develop this thing in Christ. Develop. Decision. You make a decision. It's permanent. I'm committed to this person. Hell or high water, I'm going to be there for him. Two, develop it. The grass is greener where you water it. Third thing, discipline. Discipline. Discipline yourself in this area. And the discipline starts with what you put in your eyes and in your heart. You're not going to be strong in this area if you're polluting your mind and your heart with dirty stuff. Discipline. And if you need to cut off some hands or gouge out some eyes, again, that means hyperbole. It means take drastic measures to bring purity in this area in your life. Discipline. Discipline. Now, some of you, church our size, said I've failed in this area or I'm struggling in this area. Will God ever forgive me? Let me tell you a story. A story about Jesus. John chapter 8. He had been up all night at the Mount of Olives, decided to come into the temple, teach at the temple. In the middle of his teaching, this 
religious, self-righteous group of people, leaders, are dragging this woman to him out in the middle of the temple court, probably half naked. And they said, teacher, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. And they tried to trap Jesus with it. They said, and Jesus, your law, the Bible says we should stone her to death. What do you say? Now, that was a trap. Why was that a trap? Because they knew Jesus was merciful. He's full of grace. They knew his teaching. And, but at the same time, the law said, she's got to be killed right now. What do you say, teacher? Remember what Jesus did? The heart of Jesus. He didn't do anything in regards to talking to them. He just got down on his knee. And he started writing something in the ground. Now, the Bible doesn't say what he's writing, but I got a hunch. I think he was writing the names of some of these self-righteous, pharmaceutical hypocrites. And I think he probably was putting their name and their most heinous sins and maybe even the dates by them. Because he gets up after writing these names or whatever he wrote on the ground. He gets up and he says, now he who is without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. And then, listen, he did after that, you know what he did again? He got down on his knee again and he wrote some more. And again, it brought conviction to these guys, probably names, maybe even put some of their names in some of the ladies they had affairs with. And then he gets up, and all those guys had dropped their rocks and went home. And then he looks over this lady that had been caught in the act of adultery. He said, woman, where are your accusers? He said, they're all gone, Lord. And then he looked at this lady in love and said, woman, Neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. And that's what God is saying to you if you've struggled in this area. God doesn't condemn you. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you. He came to heal you. He came to set you free. But he also says, go, sin no more. Let's be different. As God's people, let's be holy in this area. Let's guard our families from this garbage. Let's guard our personal lives from this garbage. Let's guard our reputation from this garbage. And let's be holy. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word this morning, God. Thank you for your forgiveness, your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the way you give us power to do what you teach us to do in your word, God. And Father, I pray for marriages in this room. And here's what I want to do right now. If you're married... I want you to stand up with your spouse right now. I want to pray for you. And even if you're here by yourself without your spouse, I want you to stand up and I want to pray for your marriages this morning. It's very important. God wants to do some some work in in marriages this morning. So stand up and I'm going to pray for you. And so, Father, I just thank you for each marriage represented in this room, God. I thank you for uh, the blessing of bringing these people together to be one flesh with their spouse, Lord. And Father, I thank you, God, for the way that you make a difference, even in our homes, Lord, in our marriages, God. Thank you for that, God. Thank you for the way that you can bring healing, too, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, uh, help some people that might be struggling in this area this morning, God. I pray for some people that, that might be, have a spouse they need to forgive. They, they might need to let go of maybe a spouse, even going outside this boundary, Lord. Only you can give them the power, Father, forgive and let go and show mercy instead of bitterness, God. And I pray that you would. God, I know your ideal, Father, is for every single married person in here to be married with their spouse the rest of their lives. You say in your word, God, that what you have joined together, let no man separate. So, Father, I pray that you'd be working that in these marriages of permanence, I pray for marriages where the spouse still is more connected with their parents than with their spouse. I pray that that would stop, that they'd leave that and they'd cleave to their husband or wife and that they'd be one flesh. I pray for every marriage in this room too, God, that there'd be a oneness. There'd be a oneness in this marriage, Lord. A new commitment to that, God. Father, where there's been neglect, I pray that there'd be attention where there's been a lack of love, Lord, get them back to your word that says we're supposed to love our spouse as Christ loved the church. Father, it's not a suggestion, it's a commandment. 
Help us heed that commandment. And I pray for romance, God. <laughs> I pray, God, there'd be a new level of romance in each marriage represented in this room, a new commitment again to date our spouses and to show them love, God. Father, no matter what's happened, that's water under the bridge. God, you have the ability and the power to unleash your love into our marriages. We pray that you would, God. Minister to every marriage, and even this week, God, even this day. Thank you, Lord, for your love, the difference it makes in our lives, Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness. It gives us power to forgive, our, forgive those people we need to forgive, God. And Father, may these marriages in this room represent the marriage between your son Jesus and yourself, Father God. And help us to emulate that love to the world. Just as, 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 as um, there's a closeness there, Father, of, of Jesus and the Father. And a closeness between Jesus and his bride, the church. Help us to have that in our marriages, that closeness, that intimacy, Father. Help us to be one with our spouses in a powerful, fresh, maybe even new way, God. May your love be poured out in our hearts this week towards our spouse, Lord. May we do some serving we haven't been doing too, Lord. If we've been just living a selfish life, Lord, help us to repent of that and start serving our spouse again too, Lord. Work that into our hearts, Father. We love you, Lord. We love that your word is just doing a great work in all of our lives, Father. Help us not to just be hearers of your word, God. Help us to be doers, God. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.